Welcome. It's our pleasure to welcome you today. My name is Marie Christine Nitzi. I'm the president of Harvard Alumni for Mental Health. And today we are welcoming you in one of our weekly events. Our programs are community based, they're designed based on the feedback of our global community of members. And we heard from our members that in terms of mental health, they wanted us to connect mental health and spirituality a little bit more. From that feedback, we started an annual lecture series, and this is our second annual lecture series hosted tonight by our Director of Culture, Diversity and Inclusion, Dr. Ngozi Okose. I will let you enjoy tonight's programming. There will be a presentation followed by a Q&A section. And if you're interested in joining us for future events, please know that next week we will also have a panel event dedicated to innovation in the space of technology and student mental health, as well as our annual yoga holiday sampler. This is a three day series for you to help welcome into the time of the end of the year without the stress and with all the relaxation. We hope you can join us for one of these future events organized and hosted by Harvard Alumni for Mental Health. Tonight, I have the pleasure to introduce our Director of, Community of Diversity, Culture and Inclusion, Dr. Ngozi Okoze, who is gonna introduce our speaker for the event. Dr. Okoze, the mic is yours. Thank you, Dr. Nitsi. Um, welcome all our participants, we're happy to have you here today. Um, today, we're going to look at mantra repetition for mental health and resilience. And we are privileged to have an expert in this field. His name is Dr. Doug Oman, and he's a professor at the University of California at Berkeley School of Public Health. Dr. Oman, teaching and research investigates spirituality, religion, and health, including randomized trials of spiritual meditation, mindfulness, and mantra repetition. He was a former president of American Psychological Association Division 36, which is the Society for the Psychology of Religion and Spirituality. He has published several books and has over 100 professional publications. I will invite Dr. Doug, welcome to our event. Welcome to accept to be part of us today. And we want you to really let us know what actually happened that made you to start looking into the interface of spirituality and religion in relation to health and with particular reference to mental health, please. We just want to know more about you. Thank, thank you uh, very much, Ngozi. It's, it's, and thank you, Marie. It's a real pleasure to, to be here and to see all of you, meet all of you. Um, yeah, I, I got started. Well, I first, uh, I, I grew up uh, myself without any spiritual or religious upbringing, uh, but I I got interested in it uh, actually when I was at at Harvard as an undergraduate, and um, and it was being talked about as part of culture. I had a a very stimulating uh, teaching assistant in my uh, undergraduate philosophy class, which I took for my humanities requirement. It was. His name was Cornell West. I got interested through him in um, in the topic of religion. He uh, came back later as a divinity school professor. And um, then um, in graduate school, I knew that I was interested in the topic of religion and spirituality and wasn't sure it was something I could study, but I had a, uh, a uh, leader of my postdoc who was uh, very, uh, firm in making people follow their own stars. So I, I had to do it just in order, you know, he, he made me follow the, the topic of studying spirituality and religion. And, and um, I mean, that, that's, that's, that's the short version of the story, which I think is enough for now, probably. Yeah, I know there's always a long version to a story. And um, 
we appreciate uh, that we, when, when, whenever we have people that will mentor, or mentor us and give us that directive that will guide us through life. Thank you. Now, please, um, Doug, can you tell us what is mantra? I really want you to delve a little deep into telling us what is it, you know? Um, how do we know what, which mantra to embrace? And um, are there some mantras that are authentic? Are there some that are fake or alternate mantras, the way we put it now, you know? And how do we know that we have the right one? And uh, if we don't have the right one, what do we do? Do we change? Do we, you know? They're all great no. questions, yeah. So a lot of my talking today will uh, be with reference to some of the studies that I've done, which are about a practice. Uh, well, it's the formal name of the program is the Matram Repetition Program, and uh, but it's closely aligned with a cross, very cross culturally, cross religious tradition prevalent practice of you could call it repetition of a mantra, you could call it repetition of a holy name. Uh, and um, uh, it, I do have some slides to make concrete what we're talking about there. Let me do a little share screen. We won't, we won't spend a lot of time looking at slides tonight, but this to try to give a sense of what we're talking about here, uh, it's a good way to begin. These are examples of uh, the types of mantras or holy, mantrams or holy names that have been uh, used across many different traditions as uh, something that one repeats a great deal, sort of um, uh, if one's walking or if one has spare time if in modern society, if one's waiting in a line, one can, uh, you know, rather than ruminate about something or be anxious about something, one can repeat uh, uh, one of these phrases over and over again. Uh, it, 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 uh, there's good reason to believe it makes a difference that they're meaningful. Uh, but in this case, uh, there are ones in all major religious traditions that, um, that point to the highest ideals of the tradition. You know, so in Christianity, the name of Jesus or Ave Maria, uh, or when you, uh, my God and my all, something used by St. Francis. In Buddhism, and it's very uh, widespread in Tibetan Buddhism to repeat the phrase, Om Mani Padme Hum, which one uh, common interpretation of that, it's not quite literal, but is uh, the jewel in the lotus of the heart, meaning sort of one's uh, the deepest uh, realization that one can have uh, the highest, uh, highest truth. Um, uh, there are other uh, mantras also in Buddhism in East Asia. Um, uh, the Nimbutsu, Namu Amida Butsu is very common. Hinduism, Rama Rama, which is Mahatma Gandhi's mantra, means joy, uh, the joy within. Uh, there are others in uh, Judaism, in Islam, in the name of Allah in Islam. So there are uh, this type of practice has been uh, used across all the major traditions, not, not necessarily in every, every denomination, but across all the major traditions. And just to fix this in our mind, let me, uh, 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 let's see, I can answer the slide. Uh, I need to... uh, Dr. Doug, please, can uh, you, I don't know, it's fading, your voice is fading on my side. Can oh, you speak up a little bit? Fading. Yeah. I will try to speak up. Um, okay. I don't think I did anything different, but I will try to speak up. Okay. Okay. And so uh, just to help fix in our minds uh, the, the fact that these, this type of practice is rooted in both Western and Eastern traditions, here's an example from uh, St. John Cassian, who lived uh, in the the fourth and fifth centuries, uh, he had a particular verse from a psalm that he used. The thought of this verse should be turning unceasingly in your heart. This is from his conferences. Uh, the cloud of unknowing, uh, which is 14th century English, 
they it also advised a practice very much like that, repeating the word. Uh, in their case, it was the word God over and over again. So this is it's a, it's surprising the way the practice uh, keep uh, emerges in in so many different cultures. In uh, Buddhism, this is a very this uh, eminent uh, Tibetan Rinpoche that lived this century. He advised that the Om Mani Padme Hum. It's it's the compassion, the wisdom of all the Buddhas manifested as sound. Take your refuge there. Uh, Rabbi, uh, I'm not sure I'm pronouncing this correctly, Rabbi Nachman of Braslov, uh, he, uh, in Hasidic Jewish tradition, he advised Rabbono Shalom, uh, Hebrew for master of the universe, in the name of God, as, as something to be repeated a great deal. Uh, 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 Sufism uh, is much repetition of the name of Allah. And just a couple of more examples here, and then we'll uh, continue with Hinduism. Mahatma Gandhi uh, repeated himself the word, uh, the mantra Rama, meaning joy, over and over again. He called it his staff of life that got him through every ordeal, and uh, he he believed that uh, every tradition had uh, could get the same effects. And uh, here's one more from the Eastern Orthodox tradition. This is one way that it did has entered the stream of Western culture, uh, the way of a pilgrim that's a, a, a Russian pilgrim, uh, frequently offered the prayer of Jesus, which is Lord Jesus Christ, uh, Son of God, have mercy on me. Uh, he uh, repeated it over and over again. It's a wonderful book that's uh, was translated into English. So um, just wanted to to share these with you to give you a sense of how cross-cultural it is. So um, uh, there is a there are reasons to believe that uh, it's good. if if one wants to repeat a phrase over and over again in this manner, it's good to have it connect to a high ideal that one believes in. So it should be something personally congenial, but it should also be, uh, uh, there's reason to believe it's good if it's from a tradition, because it will stand the test of time better. It will, uh, if when, you know, if you, if you really feel good when you eat a cheeseburger and you try to make cheeseburger your, your mantra, it, it may work for a while, but in the long run, it it might not have the same staying power as if you draw something from a tradition like this. So I, I'm not sure if I've answered all your questions, Ngozi. Yes. Are you able to yes. hear me okay? Yes. yes, you did. And the slide actually made it you know, even easier. We're already getting questions, actually, or comments in the um, chat room, but we'll wait until towards the end, okay, so that you address them. Now, um, Tell us how mantra repetition works. We, um, we know that it helps to foster mindfulness and also helps to combat negative thoughts. For some of us in private practice, our um, Bible for, to combating negative thoughts is cognitive behavior therapy. So now we want to see how this mantra repetition, which you, like you said earlier, is rooted in both Eastern and Western tradition, which I like because it's kind of more universal. Can you tell us how it works? And then um, what's the difference between meditation, which many of us know, and mantra repetition? Yes, uh, the, a word that uh, we often use in describing the, the program that we've done research on, is we call it portable mantra repetition. And uh, so it, it, it can be done throughout the day when you have a spare moment, uh, when you're walking from one office to another, from one building to another, uh, or say when you're falling asleep at night or waiting in line, you can, you can repeat it. So in that way, it's, it's portable. Whereas I usually use the word uh, and I think 
many people do uh, use the word uh, meditation to refer to a sitting practice. So it's quite possible to do both practices, sometimes do meditation, sometimes do portable mantra repetition, you know, depending where you are in the course of your day. Uh, so that's the way I tend to distinguish them. Of course, you know, different words get used with, you know, some people will talk about walking meditation, but, you know, at least today, that's the way I use those terms. And um, the, the function of them, I, I, I think there are a lot of um, ways one can describe the function of mantra repetition uh, in psychological language. One, uh, maybe there are two overarching categories that one could use, which would be, um, on the one hand, it can be immediate coping to immediately deal with stress. In fact, if there's something agitating that uh, that is happening uh, right now, you get some bad news, you can immediately uh, repeat the mantra to sort of recenter yourself and so on. So that would be immediate stress coping. Psychologically, one could talk about it as shifting the focus of attention. One could also talk about it as activating a frame of a longer term perspective, you know, your higher ideals. Maybe, maybe the bad news is big in one context, but against the larger context of your spiritual goals or whatever, maybe, you know, maybe it's not that big. So if you act, if you repeat your mantra, it will help activate, remind you of that larger context. So there are a number of sort of immediate kind of stress um, coping. You could look on it as a coping technique. Uh, there could be more to say on that. Uh, but another way to look at it is it's also long-term um, resilience building that uh, if you keep doing it over and over again, and in fact, um, uh, if that's one of the reasons to repeat it a lot when you're walking between buildings, you know, maybe you're maybe you aren't feeling stressed at all, but if you uh, are repeating it in between those times, that adds to the resilience building function. It it sort of gets it deeper there in your consciousness, more deeper. Uh, more readily available when you do need it, when it's when it's under stress. So those are maybe maybe two broad uh, complementary ways that it it works together. Um, I don't know if I've, I've fully answered your question, but keep keep at me for. Yes, you did, uh, and I'll follow up on that. You know, it's very interesting to hear you say portable mantra repetition. Because for most part, when we are doing meditation, we are in one location doing what we have to do. But now you are telling us that you can actually be climbing the stairs and doing, doing your mantra repetition or that doing skiing or playing basketball or doing everything. And um, what, what, when, when is the best time? I'm sure there must be a, a, a time that mantra repetition could be more effective than others? Mm -hmm. um, there's usually, yeah, usually uh, it's best not to do it when you need to concentrate on something. So um, maybe if you're a really good skier, you don't need to concentrate on it much. I, uh, as far as I got, I usually needed to concentrate when I'm going down the hill. But um, uh, if you're driving, it's probably don't don't repeat a mantra because sometimes um, sometimes that can relax you too much. If you if there's something you're doing, chopping vegetables in your kitchen, should probably give all your attention to the task at hand. Uh, but other than that. Uh, other than when you're doing something that you really need to concentrate on, which uh, probably would mean a lot of, you know, intellectual activities too, like listening to somebody, somebody uh, speak or whatever, something you really need, reading something. Uh, but, but a lot of other things like washing the dishes is a great time to do it because uh, that probably doesn't need your full concentration. You can just have it there sort of absorbing the extra 
attention that might otherwise go to, you know, worrying about something or whatever. And then walking, uh, walking. Um, if you're waiting there in the dental chair before the dentist comes, that's a great time, you know, uh, rather than thinking about, oh gosh, what's going to happen. And so, um, 